The greatest thing about 2016 is that for the first time in history, it's possible to conveniently present from a Linux machine without configuring x11.conf on stage. Uh, if we could all please get a round of applause for uh, x11 for finally working. We live in the future. So um, how many of you remember 2014? Uh, there was this lovely TV show called Scorpion. It's the one where the, the guys are in the car and they have to race the airplane in order to run an Ethernet cable up to the airplane to install a firmware update so the airplane can land. Um, there's also uh, this post on um, Dave Vitale's mailing list, uh, Daily Dave, in which he's uh, attacking the idea of junk hacking. Uh, because from his perspective, there were lots of uh, talks that were coming out uh, and papers that were coming out in which junk was being hacked, where the, uh, the security implications don't actually count. Um, and, and this matters if all you care about is security, but I don't really give a damn about security. I give a damn about reverse engineering. And reverse engineering tricks can be taught through junk hacking because we can sort of step back emotionally from the target and not uh, act as if we're um, like stoning children. Uh, because when you uh, attack a popular target, for example, uh, the, the DNS servers in North America are getting hit by a DDoS attack, right? Uh, lots of people can't watch their YouTube videos and they feel really bad about this. So like, whoever's doing this is kind of a jerk. Um, I say this now and then uh, you know, maybe the blog goes offline or something. But it's true because like, the uh, when, when a valuable target is attacked, people get sad. When a, a target is attacked that doesn't actually matter for security purposes, or doesn't matter directly, you're able to publish your results without uh, having to focus on the, um, the morality of attacking that target. If you reverse engineer a children's toy, or an amateur radio, or these sorts of things, uh, no baby seals are being clubbed to death and people don't get as emotional about it. And that allows you to sort of step back and share technical tricks with the, the focus being on how to do the thing rather than on what was done. Um, in this lecture, I'm, I'm going to be sharing with you a number of the junk hacking results that were overlooked, the things that you probably saw on slashdot.org or on Hackaday, and then you skipped past because the description was so vague that uh, you had no idea what the hell they did. Um, like, how many of you remember that Charlie Miller did not blow up Apple batteries? Okay, and then how many of you like, read the rest of the article to see exactly what he did with them, instead of just skipping on? So this is a problem. Like, he did some really, really cool stuff with these batteries, and nobody paid attention to it. Nobody paid attention to uh, how he did what he did. Uh, they just sort of got to the headline and then moved on. Um, I'm going to begin, though, with uh, a rather low-tech uh, hack that came from a fellow named Ralph. Um, Ralph is a character in the local amateur radio scene in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, I know that Europeans suck at geography, but this is in the southeast of the United States, in the mountains. And with the mountains, uh, we put the, the radio repeaters on top of the mountains. So as you're driving in your car, your car sends a signal up to the mountaintop. Then the mountaintop sends it down to everybody else, and we can have conversations this way. And when we have conversations, people talk about stupid and illegal things that they've done. Um, the, there are retired police officers who talk about uh, like all of the stuff that they saw while they were on the, the police force and uh, like colleagues getting bribed and that sort of stuff. Uh, Ralph is not a policeman, and I thank God for this every single morning. Um, Ralph is a little bit crazy. You should not take any legal advice from Ralph. Uh, Ralph is like sort of obsessed with with self defense and, and guns and that sort of stuff. But like he's a really old man who like might not uh, uh, might not be such a threat. So um, Ralph decided to like go to police auctions because he's not a policeman but he wants to be. And he buys used equipment from the police auctions. Um, so he bought his own radar gun for checking the speed of cars. And then he took this radar gun and he went to a Wendy's parking lot 
and he sat in the Wendy's parking lot with a view of the highway going past the Wendy's, and he would aim the radar gun at the cars so that as they were going by, the radar detectors in those cars would go off and the drivers would screech to a halt thinking that they were getting scanned by the police when it was actually just Ralph sitting in the parking lot. Now, the staff at the Wendy's saw him doing this and they're, they're sick of him. So they called the police, the real police, not the like Ralph pretend police. Uh, and the real police came and they... They went up to Ralph's window and they said, Ralph, this is the third time we've been calling you this week. We're tired. It's early. We need some donuts and coffee. Like, could you please just go home? And Ralph is like, you can't tell me what to do. The government, the Constitution. They're like, Ralph, we're not arresting you. We're not fining you. We're just telling you to grow the fuck up and go the fuck home. Like, please, for the love of God, Ralph. Like, you know, I don't want to be here. I want to be eating donuts. Go home. And Ralph said, but well, I don't want to go home. And they said, okay, you don't have to go home, Ralph, but you can't stay here. So Ralph went to this location, which is Klingman's Dome, which is the highest location in the Southern Appalachians. Uh, from this observation tower, you can see four American states. You can see uh, hundreds of kilometers of Interstate Highway 75 and 40 and 440 and 465, uh, all a very nice view of everything. So Ralph stood on this observation tower just after nightfall, and he aimed his radar gun down at the highway. And wherever he aimed the radar gun, all of the taillights would turn red as the drivers were braking for hundreds of kilometers in each direction. <laughs> And so Ralph was able to do this uh, not because of any like, extreme technical knowledge, uh, but just because he started toying around with the thing trying to figure out what could be done with it. Uh, if Ralph were just like a little bit more interested in it, he could set up an omnidirectional antenna, walk up to Klingman's dome, and then just hit the entire state at once with this. And all the radar detectors would go off, and all of the people would slam on their brakes, and, and Ralph would giggle and then um, go back to his theory about wasp spray. Uh, wasp spray, we have stinging insects in uh, the States, and they're very uh, big and they're very ugly. If you ever want to like, scare the living hell out of your children, look up Southern Appalachia tree wasp on YouTube. Um, the, the queen has a stinger as long as her entire body, uh, and she stings it into a tree in order to lay eggs inside of the tree. So Ralph's idea was that in places where he's not allowed to carry a, a gun in his car, or pepper spray in his car, he could instead carry wasp spray in his car, and then if the police hassle him for it, well, they can't do anything because there might be a wasp. And the folks in the, the radio repeater, they asked him, like, Ralph, what if you hit an innocent person in the eyes with the wasp spray? He said, oh, it's easy. I'll pee in his eyes and that'll clean it out. I'll be a good Samaritan. So, um, the first, real hack that I want to share with you, the first one that involves memory corruption, is from 1994, and then we're going to follow this up with a, a similar hack from 2013 that uses the same trick. Um, uh, how many of you remember Texas Instruments graphing calculators? Okay, cool. Uh, how many of you remember Hewlett Packard graphing calculators? All right, those are the really cool calculator people, and the rest of you should be ashamed. But the TI-85 was cool in that it was the first Texas Instruments calculator in which native machine code could be written um, by like, uh, a mere mortal. So when I was in high school, I first learned assembly language um, because of this program here, which is called Z-Shell. And all that Z-Shell does is it lets you run another program. Now, the TI-85 has a Zilog Z80 CPU, but you're only supposed to program the CPU in BASIC. Um, the, the dialect of BASIC is uh, a, a minimal one, but it lets you do all the math that you need to do. You, you have a simple text editor, so you don't have to uh, go by line numbers. Um, and the variables in BASIC are in memory by name. You refer to A and B and C. Um, you, you don't have pointers, and you don't have the ability to refer to an absolute address. And uh, these variables are garbage collected. So just like objects in uh, Java, for example, um, they move around in memory. And you have no guarantee that a variable will be at the same place tomorrow as it is today. 
Um, this is tricky when you're doing a memory corruption exploit because uh, machine code is forbidden and you don't know where anything is, so you both need to predict the position and corrupt the program counter in order to execute it, uh, which should sound kind of familiar in 2016. Um, now, there's this link cable for backups, and in backups, there's this custom menu. And the custom menu is uh, in the same data structure as the other menu pointers. It just happens to be in RAM instead of in ROM. Now, it being in uh, RAM, it, it duplicates some of the ROM menu entries, and all of the ROM menu entries consist of a string, which is what's shown on the screen, and then a pointer, which is the handler for that menu item. Um, so you can just copy the string and the pointer from any menu in the system into your custom menu, and then when you hit the custom menu button, it'll do the same thing as the regular menu item will. Um, but you can modify this pointer in the backup. So by changing the pointer, you can execute arbitrary code. There's a catch, though. Uh, which is that you don't know where anything will be. So the pointer can target arbitrary code, but where do you put that code that will be at a known position? Um, so because the variables move, uh, you, you can't really use a regular variable for this. And because memory is garbage collected and might fill up, you can't use the unused region of memory for this um, because the um, the programming for the calculator is in mask ROM, and there's no way to change the top uh, of the heap. It tries to use all of available memory. So eventually, even the junk memory will be used and overwritten. But there's one place in the calculator that is always at a known, fixed position that you can reliably control as a regular user without doing anything special. And that is the screen buffer. The screen buffer is rendered onto the LCD, uh, from like a, a source hardware address. So whatever is in that screen buffer is shown on the screen and is also executable. So Zshell would ship as a picture that you would load onto your screen and then you would use a custom menu item in order to execute the picture, which would search through memory for the, the second stage and branch to there. Now, this same trick is used in the uh, Tamagotchi Friends exploits that Natalie Savanovich wrote. Um, nowadays, she works for Google Project Zero. I think she was responsible for somewhere between a quarter and a third of all flash vulnerabilities that were patched last year. Um, and similar to the, the graphing calculator, the code in the Tamagotchi is in mask ROM. So you're not going to be able to change it. You're not able to flip bits in program memory. Um, but uh, there's external artwork that's stored in SPI Flash, and you control the external artwork in the form of uh, little plug-in modules that contain an SPI Flash ROM. So the way that her exploit worked was that she uh, found the only byte in the SPI Flash that is vulnerable to memory corruption, and then um, she placed her shell code onto the screen in the form of artwork. Um, this Photograph is from her article on the subject, and those pixels on the screen are actual shell code that can run on a real Tamagotchi. She wrote this exploit blind without actually having a copy of the firmware image until after her exploit worked in order to dump out that firmware image. Um, and so this technique from 1994 that uh, Dan Ebel used was still valid in 2013. It's still valid now in 2016. It's still valid when you're attacking smart cards. It's valid when you're attacking uh, all sorts of small embedded systems. Um, but the value in it is not that you're able to play games in your graphing calculator, much as we all love playing Mario instead of doing our calculus homework. The value in it is that you learn another trick toward writing an exploit. And this trick while it was, it was originally used against a graphing calculator or against a Tamagotchi toy, is also valid against harder targets. And you need a large collection of these tricks in order to write interesting exploits. So junk hacking lets us discuss these tricks without having to bring the emotion of the target into it. Um, if this were a smart card, then uh, Dan Ebel would be accused of hurting the banks and of uh, damaging the economy and all of this nonsense. And then there'd be a counterfaction that would say that it's a great thing and that we should burn the banks to the ground. Um, but in all of this, the, the actual technique wouldn't be paid attention to. And people would pay so much attention to the, the target rather than the method of the exploitation that uh, they wouldn't learn so much. 
There's also this idea of rights principle, um, which is that security doesn't get better until you have tools for practical exploitation and exploration of the attack surface. Um, how many of you have an Orinoco gold card or finally remember one from uh, days gone by? So this and the Prism 2 were the very first cards that allowed you to promiscuously sniff packets and inject them. Uh, injection was really janky. What you had to do is you had to write a packet into the card. The card would then rewrite all of the Wi-Fi fields to correct them. And then you had to change those fields to what you actually wanted to transmit between issuing the transmit command and the packet actually leaving the radio. And you had no feedback mechanism to know that you did it correctly. Um, but as janky as it was, it allowed you to inject raw packets. And it was within a year or two after these cards became available that WEP cracking became feasible. The, everyone knew that the cryptography in the, the early Wi-Fi protocols was theoretically bad, but they weren't able to show that it was practically bad because they weren't able to get a packet out. I had a, a project a while back called the GoodFet, um, which has since been retired. Michael Osman has uh, purchased the project for five US dollars. Uh, it's like uh, two to the 35th penga. Uh, two times 10 to the 35th, sorry. Uh, logarithms are hard in currency conversions. Um, so uh, part of what this does is it just attaches a radio chip to a Python interpreter on your laptop so that you can play around with the network. Uh, so, um, Ryan Spears, uh, a former student of mine, he came up with this board uh, based around the GoodFet, uh, which adds a, a Zigbee radio chip to it so that you can packet sniff and inject Zigbee. Um, you can also run the same firmware on commercial hardware. Um, this is a, a Spanish network adapter called the, the uh, Zolertia Zmote. Uh, and you can flash the GoodFed firmware into this device and then send and receive Zigbee packets. Uh, I did a, a HackerCon badge for the Next Hope in New York City. Um, this badge has a Nordic RF NRF 24L01 Plus radio. Um, and the cool thing about that radio is that it's used in a lot of other devices. So this is something that university students in the United States are tortured with. Um, if you had the misfortune of being in a chemistry lecture hall as big as this lecture hall, um, the chemistry professor would get really mad about people not showing up or not paying attention. So he would issue these to the students, and by issue it to them, I mean force them to purchase it from the bookstore for a hundred times the, the material cost. And then um, the, the device has like buttons so that you can vote in in-class quizzes. Unfortunately, the, uh, the device is not very reliable, so all of you in the back, you get a zero attendance score because your signal won't reach to the front of the stage. Um, but this badge has the same radio chip, so you can packet sniff and inject the, uh, the firmware of that device in order to have a, like an autoresponder so that um, you, you hide it up in the, the stage somewhere and then you get perfect attendance for a semester. Um, another device that uses this chip is the Microsoft Wireless Keyboard. Um, these have been uh, hacked repeatedly every single year since 2008 when Max Moser and Torsten Schroeder started attacking them. Um, in 2010, I came up with this commodity exploit. Um, the value in this exploit is that you can run it on a regular chip without any custom hardware. And the, um, the green text in the background is the packet sniffed text that was typed into the window in the foreground, uh, live over the air as the, the keyboard is typing. Um, but you don't, you don't find these sorts of things if you set out to uh, attack a keyboard. You find them if you set out to figure out how a radio works, and then you work backward in order to find the valid targets, or the useful targets. Um, there are other places in which Wright's principle can be applied. There's a program called Crack LE by Mike Ryan. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy uses a much easier encoding scheme than old-fashioned Bluetooth does. Um, so it's much easier to capture packets or to inject them than it ever was before. He's able to use this in order to capture the key exchange on the air and then man in the middle Bluetooth Low Energy connections. Uh, GR Laura by Matt Knight. Uh, the description for how that was engineered is in this book. Um, 
Proof of concept to get the fuck out 13, which you can find in the hardware hacking village. Um, LoRa is a low power, long range uh, wireless sensor networking protocol. Um, you can use it in order to create hops in a rural area of three to four kilometers uh, on a low powered device. And these networks are being thrown up everywhere and no one yet has really good tools for interacting with them. Uh, Thanks to GR Laura and similar research, this is going to change over the next two to three months. Uh, and four months from now, you might be able to war drive for Laura as conveniently as you now do for Wi-Fi. Um, because these junk things are converted into networking adapters that then allow you to participate as part of these networks, to sniff and to inject instead of merely knowing that they exist. Um, one of the, the most valuable things if you actually want to do junk hacking instead of just talking about junk hacking is you need to be able to dump the firmware in order to have uh, code to work with. Uh, when you're reverse engineering PC software or cell phone software, you have the advantage that getting a copy of the application is rather easy. So you take the .exe file, you open up it up in IDA Pro or Radara 2, and then you can begin reverse engineering. But in an embedded system, the firmware is held inside of a chip on a circuit board and you need to get it out. Here are a couple of tricks for doing that. So you can just ask politely. Um, this uh, clicker, as they call it, this classroom remote control, um, it has inside of it a, a single chip that is both a CPU and a radio. Now, when a microchip manufacturer is trying to make a, a radio for the first time, uh, and they want to add a CPU to it, well, adding a CPU to a working radio design is easy because the CPU is digital and doesn't involve anything fancy and analog. Um, similarly, if they have flash memory working and they want to add a CPU to the flash memory, that's easy because the CPU is digital. But if you want to add flash memory to an existing design, that gets very hard because flash memory is analog and it requires uh, special processes. And similarly, if you want to add a radio to an existing design, that's hard because you need very uh, well-known um, tolerances and there's ugly analog stuff. So um, when they were designing this chip, uh, they weren't able to have both flash memory and the radio on a single die. So they put the radio and the CPU on one die and then the flash memory is off to the side. So uh, this big chip here in the middle, that's the CPU. And this little chip in the bottom left with the eight pins, that chip is the memory. And so you can just wire up to the memory chip and politely read it and get a clean copy of everything that's in the device. You can then patch that and rewrite it in order to change the behavior of the device and nothing stops you. But other devices aren't so easy. Um, ARM devices, uh, AVRs, MSP430s, everything larger than like um, an entry-level chip or a unique one-off chip has a lock feature that you have to bypass. Um, one of my favorite tricks for attacking uh, ARM devices, embedded ARM, so Cortex-M3, Cortex-M4, uh, I like to use null pointer dereference reads. Now on Unix and Windows, these are tricky to exploit because uh, you have an uninitialized buffer, so the, the pointer points to zero. Um, when you access that zero page, it triggers a fault. So on a PC, you have to either have a very deep offset into that array, or you have to um, trick the operating system into mapping something at that address. Um, this is exploitable if you're in the right situation and you spend a lot of time and you're very smart about it. But on embedded systems, it's a very different situation. Because, um, again, you have an uninitialized pointer. It points to zero. Unlike Unix and Windows, there's actually stuff at address zero. And in the ARM Cortex-M series, the stuff that's at address zero is a duplicate copy of whatever memory you booted from. So there's another copy of firmware at address zero. And if you can trick it, the device into reading from address zero, it will give you the beginning of the application firmware. Uh, you also have uh, firmware updates. Uh, firmware updates are usually available from a manufacturer. They're quite often encrypted, 
and they're quite often encrypted poorly. So this device is the uh, Titera MD380. Um, the handheld radios that the security guards here are carrying, uh, those are from Hi-Terra. This is from Tai-Terra, so the H becomes a T, which is the minimal hamming distance to not commit trademark infringement. Um, this is a Chinese design. Uh, the firmware updater application actually tries to put Chinese text onto the Latin title bar and creates all of these funky um, misrendered characters. But you can install the firmware update. Now, the firmware update um, is a very simple protocol, but the update file is encrypted, so you're not able to read it directly. Um, what you can do is you can use the null pointer dereference trick that I mentioned a few slides back, and you can use it to dump the bootloader that decrypts the firmware updates. Now, the bootloader is responsible for uh, two important things. The first is that it accepts the firmware update and writes it into flash memory while decrypting it, um, which is cool because that means that it includes the keys. Um, but the other thing that it does is it locks JTAG. JTAG is a debugging protocol that you can use in order to attach a debugger to your embedded device in order to single step it, read memory, write memory, uh, everything that you would ever want as far as system privileges go. So what you can do is you can dump out the bootloader and then you can reverse engineer just enough of it to find just that one function that actually locks the device, which is shown here. And then you can change a single byte. In this case, uh, there's a 5-5 five five byte that you can change to an AA byte. And then instead of locking itself, the device will just double check that it's unlocked and then keep going. You then write this into a fresh chip, and then you have an emulator of the radio that accepts firmware updates and decrypts them and writes them to flash memory, but does not lock out any debuggers. So then you can dump out a copy of the main application image uh, in clear text and then compare it to the cipher text of the firmware update. And when my, my friend Paula joined the project and she compared them, um, she found that if you XORed the ciphertext with the clear text, you got a repeating 512-byte pattern, which is the XOR key, which is enough to decrypt and encrypt any firmware update that might ever come for the radio. So you can then grab every version that's ever been made from the manufacturer's website, download them, decrypt them, and reverse engineer them and patch them. Uh, we now have an open source project built around this radio that adds such features as promiscuous mode. Um, we place our own firmware patches into um, the region of flash memory that was previously taken by the Chinese font, because the Chinese font it takes up a fifth of all flash memory, and none of us speak Chinese. Now, these JTAG locks are, are useful in another way, because um, you know, th this is what prevents the use of a debugger. So if you can bypass this, then you can unlock any chip in that family. So instead of looking for a bug in a particular target, instead of trying to find a bug in a radio or in a keyboard or in a toaster, um, you can instead uh, just figure out how its lock works and then find a trick to go around it. Uh, so they, these things usually have a fuse check, um, which is where they check to make sure that a, a piece of the chip has not been damaged. Um, they also have a, a password that you can uh, apply in some of them in order to unlock the chip. Uh, and sometimes these aren't documented. Um, quite often these are vulnerable to fault injection. So one way that I bypass this with the MSP430 is I remove the lid of the chip with white fuming nitric acid in order to expose the dye. Uh, so in this photograph you have the packaging of the chip partially removed um, in the beginning in the middle, you can see the actual chip die, and then it has bond wires that are running to the metal pins that extend outside of the package. Now, this die is physically exposed to the outside now, uh, and all of the transistors are sitting there on, on the surface, uh, and the thing about a transistor, you know, it, it switches. Um, do any of you know what a phototransistor is? A phototransistor is a transistor that's designed to tell how bright a light is uh, as a sensor input. You use this for receiving an infrared remote control. It turns out 
that all transistors are phototransistors. They just happen to have the black epoxy over it so that light doesn't get into the chip. In order to break this chip, what you can do is you can make your JTAG debugger repeatedly try the fuse check. So it's sitting there like an annoying child saying, like, can I get in? Can I get in? Can I get in? Can I get in? And then you take a camera flash, and you flash the camera over the chip die. All of the light floods the chip. All of the uh, flip-flops inside of the chip and the logic gates, they all go screwy for a little minute. And then they settle down afterward. And your, your odds are about one in four that they'll settle down with the JTAG in the unlocked state as if you had performed the check. And then you can attach your debugger and read all of the memory out of the device. You also have uh, mask ROM bootloaders. So uh, when I first reverse engineered the radio, um, I, used, uh, I used the null pointer dereference in order to read a copy of the, the flash bootloader out of the device. And then I tapped this little red wire onto a little test point, and I pulled that wire to high voltage. And then uh, when you reboot the chip this way, it starts a mask ROM program that is physically a part of the chip and can't be removed. And this mask ROM uh, is a program, and it does complicated things. This is um, an electron microscope photograph of an MSP430 F2274. Um, the cool thing about an electron microscope is that you can keep zooming in, but you don't say zoom in, you say enhance. So, it, enhance. This is the mask ROM. Here we see it in a light photograph. You see that there are 16 columns. This is a 16-bit microcontroller. There are 16 bits per instruction word. This is not a coincidence. These little dots are ones and zeros. You can actually read out a copy of this program visually and then reverse engineer it and disassemble it from that. And if you find a bug inside of this bootloader, well, the bug is in a physical mask on that chip. And for every chip in that family, that bug might be related. So you might be able to uh, pop more than one chip in the series. And each one of these devices if vulnerable to a bug that you find here, um, is vulnerable to it at the microchip mask level. It costs a minimum of $150,000 to replace the layer that contains this mask ROM. So in order for the manufacturer to patch the bug, they have to pay $150,000 per model number, assuming that they don't make a mistake and have to pay it again. It can actually cost upward of a million dollars to patch a bug in the mask ROM. So the manufacturers don't do it. The, the bugs that you find in this program, they remain for years. And they remain exploitable, and you can still attack them. And then you can hit any device that contains this chip inside of it in order to locally extract its firmware despite a lock. It goes without saying that you really shouldn't read the news. Um, uh, how many of you saw this this morning? Uh, so there's a cyber attack, there's DOS. Um, I love the way that they spell it, like it's a disk operating system. Um, but these same descriptions of like, things that actually happen, I mean, there is a denial of service attack going against DNS right now. Um, you know not to pay attention to the Fox News description of that attack. Uh, but at the same time, like, you might pay too much attention to CNET and mistake very valuable research that you ought to be reading for um, nonsense junk hacking that you can skip by. Um, so Charlie Miller had a, a paper on battery firmware hacking. Um, this paper is 38 pages long, and it got reduced to a single headline of um, hacker laptop batteries can be... Uh, a new security threat. What he actually did um, was he identified that inside of the MacBook batteries, there's a chip called the BQ29312. Um, he did this as his first hardware hacking project. So he went about everything in a sort of weird way. Um, he identified the chip 
not by reading the part number off of the board, but he identified it by scanning to see which I2C addresses the device responded to, and then searching through all of the Texas Instruments documentation in order to find a chip that matched those register names. He then uh, got a development kit for this chip, um, managed to use the, uh, the compiler in order to produce a binary, and then he took the binary and he identified the architecture for it. It's a, a cool risk. 816. Um, so he wrote a new IDA Pro module in order to reverse engineer this rare architecture. He reverse engineered the firmware, um, and then he, um, using this reverse engineered firmware, he was able to do things like lie about the, the battery's capacity or um, brick the battery. He was not able to make the battery explode, which is why the, uh, the poor reporters didn't get the headlines that they wanted. Um, but the purpose of reading the paper is not to blow up a battery. The purpose of reading the paper is to learn how to reverse engineer your own target, which is something other than a battery, but for which those same tricks might be valuable. There are other nifty projects like this that uh, are, are passed off as artistic projects or um, uh, reverse engineering projects. So uh, do any of you remember Rockbox? Um, this is replacement firmware that runs for the iPod. Um, it, you would always see this as Doom runs on the iPod, as, as if the greatest thing in the world would be that you could have like pocket video games on an iPod. Um, and, and 10 years ago, this really mattered before, uh, before smartphones were available. So um, a few years back, I was on a train to New Hampshire, and I downloaded Rockbox. I got the source code, I built the compiler, I board my train, and I have uh, seven hours aboard this train. And I, as I'm playing around with it, and I'm, I'm rewriting the firmware on my iPod, um, I looked into how the Rockbox kernel implements a USB mass storage device. And it, it turns out that the C source code for its USB stack is very clean and easy to read. So um, in addition to letting you play Doom on your iPod, uh, you also have a complete development kit for a thumb drive in which you can do anything you want on a system with rather a large amount of memory, uh, tons of storage, and the ability to log things and check them back later. Um, so what I did was I changed the behavior of the, um, the SCSI read command that actually reads blocks off of the device. Um, because I thought that uh, in forensics, um, when a disk is being imaged for uh, a legal case, there's a very set procedure to it. The first thing that you do is you image the disk. You use DD or the equivalent fancy forensics tool. And uh, just like Alice in Wonderland, it begins at the beginning and then it works its way to the end and then it stops. And it produces a checksum of that disk in order to... Uh, show that the, the disk that was imaged has a checksum uh, or a cryptographic hash or whatever they do. Um, so what I did was uh, I made a partition that didn't actually have anything in it near the beginning of the partition table. And then if, the, um, if anything is read out of the middle of that partition, the disk will change the read behavior to a write so that whenever you read an even block, it overwrites it with the string, never going to give you up. And whenever you have an odd block, it will never let you down. So that the end result is that if you forensically disk image my iPod, you get a bunch of Rick Astley lyrics uh, with a cryptographic checksum that passes all of the quality control that you've promised in court a thousand times are, um, are valid. And you can do this with very little code. You can do this with 20 or 30 lines of code. Um, because the Rockbox team has gone to all of the effort of reverse engineering the iPod, of porting their kernel, of maintaining their code, of maintaining the development kit. Um, as, as a similar project, uh, and with a ton more work, uh, while I was at Euricom in Sofia Antipolis, um, we wrote this paper, uh, one of those weird academic ones, uh, Implementation and Implications of a Stealth Hard Drive Backdoor. Um, we implemented this as a firmware patch to Seagate Barracuda drives, uh, the like 750 gigabyte ones. Um, what we did was we wrote a, a rootkit that runs inside of the hard disk firmware 
that is remotely accessible through the internet without host collusion, meaning that it's not actually getting code execution on the host, it's not bothering to. Instead, what it does is it waits for a write to occur, and then it very quickly checks to see if the write has like a, a magic signature in it. And if the magic signature is there, then it runs the command that is inside that block and writes the result of the command instead of the command itself. So um, you have, uh, let's say, a database server, and the database server is using our tampered hard disk. Um, an attacker might go to the website, some stupid social media website, and update his profile. And the profile will become uh, like a command for the hard disk that says, hey, can you give me a copy of slash etc slash shadow? So the web server then creates a SQL command, which writes this to the MySQL database. The MySQL database writes this to the MySQL storage engine. The storage engine writes it to the ext4 file system. The ext4 file system then writes it to the block device. The block device then writes it to the hard disk. The hard disk sees that it's a command, runs the command, grabs the etc shadow file, and then the attacker can say, hey, wait, what was my social media profile again? And get a copy of the etc shadow file from that host. You could have prototyped this using the Rick Astley iPod in an afternoon rather than spending the months that we took to reverse engineer the real disk. Um, and the only result is like, um, whether it's USB or a serial ATA. Um, but through junk hacking and through attacking easy targets, you can then start prototyping more sophisticated attacks that might involve uh, a lot more work. Um, Micah Elizabeth Scott is uh, an artist out in California. Uh, she's also a brilliant reverse engineer. And she went on Amazon and found the most popular DVD burner. Uh, because a DVD burner is a high-powered laser with a robotic motor, and it's cool to have code execution on. In Pocket GTFO 7.3, she released a, a framework called Coaster Melt. Um, she dumped the firmware, she reverse engineered the firmware, she then patched it to implement a backdoor and a, a debug server so that she's able to connect to the device and then read out registers, write registers, trace functions, set breakpoints, all through an IPython interactive shell over the USB port without um, having to modify the hardware. There's also uh, a project called Magic Lantern that allows you to replace the firmware on your Canon DSLR photos. All of this is reverse engineering and is the exact same tricks that you need when writing an exploit or when attacking a target. But it's better documented and it can be discussed unemotionally. You're not clubbing baby seals when you're adding features to a digital camera. In conclusion, I would like you to read the following papers. Uh, if you have your phones, this is the, the slide you should photograph. Um, the Charlie Miller on Battery Hacking, the International Journal of Proof of Concept to Get the Fuck Out. Uh, you should play with the Arduino projects, even though it looks like it's something aimed for children. You can do real work on these platforms, and you have to start somewhere when you're new to electronics. Um, it's enough to teach you that it's not a special or unattainable skill, that it's something that you can sit down and learn. Um, you should also get involved in ham radio. Uh, you can just take an exam and pay a little fee and have a license to transmit with 1,500 watts. Not milliwatts, watts. Um, read data sheets for the chips in all of the hardware that you find and actually see what's inside of them, which chip does what, and read all of the documentation for it just to, to see how much of it's known. Quite a few of these chips are publicly documented and very well documented. Um, also, to learn the, the protocols for your weird networks. With the, the Internet of Things stuff, with the um, uh, wireless this and that running everywhere, it's kind of tempting to back off from it and say, well, I understand TCP IP, I don't need to understand this new thing. But you do if you actually want to mess with it. Um, and this is my cat, her name is Mimin, and she thanks you for your time and attention. <laughs>